Good morning. We would like to welcome you very cordially to our earnings report conference. We're going to talk about H1 2022. We're meeting here in very interesting times for the industry. We're going to speak about the current time, about the future. We'll talk a little bit about the past in terms of what has transpired in our bank in the last six months. So we have a typical agenda, so I won't mention everything. We can go on to the, the merits. The most information, the most important information, as is clear in Q2 of this year, the bank generated a net profit of 258 million. This is down 7% from Q1, but it's much better than the corresponding period of last year. I think this is a robust result. It's not a phenomenal result, but having regard for the circumstances, the additional burdens, I think it's a very decent result. We've been growing in terms of our lending activity, both on a quarterly basis as well as on a year-to-year -year basis. And our revenue is up by 7%. And this is because of net interest income. We had a very good uh, FX result and a stabilization of fees. If we look at our activity, there are a few things I'd like to mention. Everything else is listed in the slides and the materials. So we believe that our agile transformation is going well. The work in this format is fast, dynamic, it's engaging. We're able to give various solutions, roll them out more quickly. They're dedicated, and this is something that's positive. We focused on sustainable development. On the next slide, we'll talk about some of the numbers. 5.1 billion of new green financing. This makes us one of the leaders on the marketplace. This is something we want to maintain and strengthen. We can see that our customers are more active in digital channels, so we're more um, technologically involved. We have a good result in terms of attracting new uh, clients, also record-breaking in terms of corporate clients. We have clear revival, uh, recovery in SMEs, so we can say from the business and commercial side, for the bank, this was a good period. I mentioned the volume of green loans. This is the work, the result of the intense work done in all of our uh, client facing departments. So we're working with uh, big customers, individual customers. And I think we still are the first bank to offer mortgage loans for a fixed rate for a 10-year period. And so this was a clear response to the expectations of customers and the regulators in order to ensure that customers do not face interest rate risk for the longest period of time possible. And of course, we'll come back to this. We had several big corporate transactions and so we are strengthening our position as one of the leaders in terms of structured financing as well as m a activity and here as a team and the volumes of transactions the number of transactions are stable and this is clearly growing as you know the beginning of the war in ukraine we were quite active when it came to refugees on our employees of our sister bank we opened we are opening and continue to open dedicated accounts for ukrainian nationals we believe that we should provide them very good conditions for cooperation with the bank to ensure that they feel at least in this aspect very good in poland very well in poland i mentioned about the absorption of digital channels. We have more than a million users of the um, digital applications. So in our remote channels, 
we're automating also processes in terms of customer inquiries and requests and so there's a lot of progress we have more and more bots robots handling processes in the bank we're talking about you know uh, these loan vacations or credit vacations and i'll talk about those a little bit later <coughs> what else can i say if we look at other pillars of our strategy together i've mentioned agile everything's going well here I'm also pleased by things like appreciation for the fact that we look at diversity and inclusion. We're emphasizing that perhaps this could be translated more differently and both internally and we want to make sure that our customers, how, regardless of how they differ, we want everybody to feel well in our bank for them to have equal access access we have certification of access in our branches to all customers regardless of the type of difficulties and obstacles they face so if we look more specifically at the figures you can track some of the trends we can see the number of go myable users is growing very strongly and so it's a friendly application i use it we're developing its functionality uh, we have peer-to-peer -peer bleak. We have a large number of customers who are happily using that, willingly using that. You can see the number of bleak transactions is growing rapidly, 22% up Q1 Q from quarter to quarter. And so this is, shows that this has had been noticed and appreciated. So if we look at retail banking, and so we can say that the total result for the two quarters, first two quarters is very robust, even though one was better than the other. And we can see that the interest in uh, funds, investment funds is, is soft because of the growth in interest rates. So there's nothing to brag about here. But if we look at the sales of cards, we can say this is quite robust growth and that's good and so this is a product which is attractive to customers and at the same time it generates profits for the bank if we look at other forms of lending to individual customers we continue to say continue to see that cash loans and similar loans are continuing to grow but we have a clear decline if we look at mortgage loans and so this decline this is there's no secret this secret or this decline got even bigger after the close of the first half of the year so this is a clear trend on the market this is a result of the higher interest rates which are curtailing demand and we also have the uh, burdens of this specific product where we have the regulatory risk when we have uh, credit vacations or loan vacations which is something that's uh, painful to the industry i mentioned the record-breaking numbers of institutional clients that have been attracted so in corporate banking and SMEs and so we're clearly moving forward here we were talking with our managers yesterday and so the bank is standing on two very strong legs so the retail leg including personal finance as well as on that institutional leg where we have EIB and uh, cover per clients as well as then uh, SMEs. So our market shares have risen in loans and deposits. And this shows that the bank was in an upward trend. The number of customers is up more than 4 million customers. This is very important to us because growth can be achieved by adding new customers and then expanding the scope of services offered to them and that's something that's happening in the bank so the net banking income is you know nearly seven percent quarter on quarter in q2 uh, it's well it's 36.2 percent year on year so this result 
is relatively lower, especially year on year, than compared to our competitors. This is a result of the fact we have been very conservative in terms of the security for interest rates on our portfolio and that's something that's generated the result here but if the trend reverses especially with interest rates then we're going to lose less compared to other banks that have a different hedging policy if we look at cost we have the IPS component so the formal number this is this is the commercial banking system protection but we can call it SOPKA or IPS and so basically we make payments to that institution of 180 million zlotys in Q2 of this year so we have if we overlook this one costs would have grown less but there's also cost pressure linked to inflation. We're monitoring that situation and we're actively managing that. We'll continue that. But with certain cost items, there are things, there are not many things you can do, especially like energy costs. In Q2, we've added provisions for the Swiss franc uh, risk, 140 million more than in Q1. And having been this coupled with the IPS effect, that means the profit, reported profit, is lower by 7% than in Q1. So if we were to, of course, uh, adjust for that Swiss franc impact, it would have been higher. 258 million net profit in current reality is a very robust result. I hadn't said that previously, but I wanted to say that. Maybe a few ratios which are very important. So the cost of risk, we can say that the situation is very much under control. We believe in the quality of our portfolio. This is marginal growth. In Q2, it's more or less the same level. And even though we have the slowdown in the economy, we don't see a threat to our portfolio. Of course, Mr. Kambowski will speak to that in just a few moments. The ROE in H1 is 9.6%, so it's a little bit lower than in Q1. But we have to remember the IPS is 180 million cost, and then we have higher provisioning for C for Swiss franc loans. And then we have the cost income ratio is essentially without any change. There is cost side pressure. And this is something that has made it more difficult to improve that uh, ratio. So where are we, generally speaking? Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned we're in a very interesting point in time for the banking sector. I believe we're also in a very difficult moment and a number of factors are taking place at the same time these are macroeconomic factors so we have economic slowdown a recession on the horizon high inflation and as a result high interest rates there is inconsistency between the monetary policy and the fiscal policy which makes it more difficult to manage such high inflation we know it's much higher than other close countries if we look from the left side so we have the IPS the cost of IPS is significant but the idea of building a private system to protect commercial banks is a good idea in our bank is involved and has been involved in this project from the beginning it's a grassroots initiative banks in the sector so private banks as well as banks controlled in one way or another by the state treasury and it's good that this institution is being set up and this will make our sector more stable 
but this is a charge to this year's second Q2 results. Then we have credit holidays. I'm not going to say much about what they entail because that's something that everybody knows. I believe and have believed from the very beginning that it's bad to roll out credit holidays in this way. It's socially unjust as well as when we talk about trying to maintain the strength and stability and soundness of the banking industry. So these credit holidays are available to all borrowers. So people, borrowers who have difficulties as a result of higher inflation and you know maintaining their budgets as well as it's offered also to those people who are very wealthy. And so they've bought exclusive properties and expensive and so it's also available to people for people who've taken out fixed interest loans when interest rates were very low. So it'd be very difficult to justify why those customers should receive um, assistance or relief from banks and their shareholders and their situation hasn't changed. And so these are customers who are paying 2.5% per annum. Well, if we look at interest rates right now, that's a very attractive level. And so directing assistance or aid to those persons is something that's improper. One can, of course, enter into polemics about the number of installments that could be suspended. I'm afraid that this initiative, generally speaking, will have an adverse impact on the ethics of discharging liabilities because it shows that financial liabilities do not always have to be paid down at the contractually agreed deadlines. And that suggests they don't have to be paid at all. And so I am troubled by this. The entire sector is troubled by this. And so in our statements, we wanted to civilize these credit holidays and direct them to people who need them. And our voice was not heard. So we continue to hope that there will be no other ideas leading to similar repercussions that would be implemented through legislation. As you know, the credit holiday estimate for us, the cost of that, 700 to 950 million. And so we're going to monitor this situation as we post the 700 million. And depending on how things develop, we'll adjust the posting here. And so we have additional money for the borrower's support fund. This is something that's been around since 2016 and hasn't been used practically at all. And the number of customers interested in utilizing this support is the number of people is on the rise. That's why the fund was set up. And then we have the Swiss franc here. The situation is very chaotic. That's why we're monitoring it regularly and we're adding provisions every quarter, in fact, in order to build a buffer for this situation. It's clear that systemically many things have not been regulated and so this chaos leads to concern and that's why we have this approach of setting up provisions and then you have the benchmark reform for Vibor. You know that Prime Minister announced this at the Katowice conference in April. This was very vague, and now as more and more details are coming out, nowhere else in the world has such a benchmark reform been done in this period that the Prime Minister has defined 
And so the Bohlers Bank Association is participating in that. People from our bank are also participating in this. And we're hopeful that we're going to be able to convince <coughs> all of the stakeholders that this reform should not take force as of 1 January of next year because it's undoable, it's unfeasible, it will lead to chaos in the Polish financing, financial system, in the external world. These things should be done in a cogent fashion, well thought through, methodologically, they should be done conscientiously. And the period uh, left up until the end of this year will not allow for that to take place. And so I'll end my, this part of the section with a reflection in terms of the circumstances in which we're functioning. And I'll support this with some numbers. Ladies and gentlemen, since 2016, the bank has paid some four billion uh, in four point seven billion in fees, dues, taxes to the um, various state treasuries, and of course, we haven't paid a single. Zwadi of dividend, and the situation is that the likelihood of paying a dividend is very low. The conclusion is, realistically, the legal and economic framework that's been created in Poland to speak as gently as possible is not fair, not just for investors, for shareholders, for banks. And I think one should think about that in terms of the narration which is being put forward around banks. I think it's a very aggressive, unjust, it's unnecessary, in which we forget about the role played by banks in the economy, what role they should be playing in difficult times, and how they should support the economy when the economy is emerging from um, a difficult period. I think we're decent people. We've done a lot of good. We've made mistakes, but well, f fundamentally, we do not deserve such a narration or such a situation. So let's go on and look at the macroeconomic environment. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So the environment is deteriorating, and we're moving into a period of recession. So if we look at the accounts for the National Bank of Poland for Q2, they show a shrinkage of uh, the economic activity over the last three months. All of the uh, indices available suggest that this decline will be continued in the current quarter and probably in the subsequent quarter. So on, on, on top of these uh, environmental or, or the cyclical things linked to the structure of our GDP, looking at inventories, one of the most important factors in terms of the length or the depth of this slowdown. This is the supply of energy carriers such like natural gas for Poland and EU. This is an important factor. And at present, there's no good response whether or not that supply will be available, and if so, to what extent. This is something that we will pay attention to in subsequent months. Unfortunately, this recession, upcoming recession, is accompanied by high inflation. It's not only because of high supply-side factors. We have domestic factors as well. They're not just external. We have very high nominal 
increase of wages, the fiscal policy not very strong, and this is contributing to this, and in subsequent months, this will continue to be the case, and so this does not make the situation easier of this, it doesn't make it easier for the central bank or for the monetary policy council and so the inconsistency in terms of the policy mix is very important and it's very significant and very bad in these uncertain times so this cycle has been in place for some time in terms of tightening monetary policy we're certainly closer to the end of this cycle than we were at the beginning that does not mean however that the interest rates will stay at the current level. So on top of the macroeconomic factors, so inflation, economic growth, in subsequent months, we'll have to pay attention to what the conduct will be on the financial market, including the FX market. If we look at the last 15 months or so and what the polis wadi has been done it's hard to resist the impression that everything's okay in terms of the fundamental factors we have to have in mind that the fundamentals will get better from the fx market point of view and this will be an additional factor making things more difficult to pursue economic policy including monetary policy and then last but not least from the point of view of the banking sector what does this macroeconomic environment mean it doesn't mean good times it means more challenges it means more difficulties it means more concerns in terms of the pace of lending activity so if you look at retail loans or household loans the slowdown or the decline in demand well these signs are very clear but this recession could affect corporate loans demand which had been growing very fast in the last several months or 12-15 months and so this growth rate could be softened Good morning. Of the year, we deliver solid financial results despite the headwinds and the creation of IPS. It will help us to cope with the new challenge we will, uh, which will occur in the second half of the year, and I'm referring to the first one, which is uh, the credit holidays. Impact is going to be huge for the banking sector and for the bank as well. In terms of business. So very good performance for the business. Our loan book grew by 14.2% year to year. We strengthened our deposit base, which grew by 13.6%. Uh, capital decreased by 8% as the impact of the negative valuation of the bond portfolio. TRN close to 11%, 10.99%. I will uh, speak about it later. ROE 9.6%. Net result. 535 million slotty, up by, up by 81% year to year. If we are excluding the impact of CHF, up by 37% year to year. NBI, 3 billion uh, slotty, up by 31.9% year to year, the main driver being the net interest income, resulting from the positive impact of the interest rate hike and the growth of the loan book. Good performance in terms of fees and commission, which grew by 19.8% year to year. As a consequence of the normalization of the cost and also the creation of IPS, cost grew by 31.2% year to year, excluding BFG contribution and IPS, the, the cost grew by 14.6%. Decrease in the cost income ratio. We keep on uh, increasing the coverage ratio in terms of CHF mortgage loan. So we book 
additional 223 million sloty and the quality of our portfolio is stable, no, no, no deterioration of the portfolio. So cost of risk, 165 million sloty. As regards our loan book, so overall loan book grew by 14.2%. On one hand, very good resilience of the institutional uh, customer's loan book, which grew by 15.7% year to year, and another very good quarter, uh, plus 3.2% compared to the first quarter. As regards uh, individuals, uh, customers, loan books, the situation is a little bit different. Year to year, positive growth, so 12.1%, but we are still uh, getting some signal of slowdown. And quarter to quarter, the loan book grew by 1.8%. In terms of market share, we reach 6.2%. As regards the CHF mortgage loan portfolio, we are keeping on increasing the coverage ratio, so we book additional provisioning. The provision reach a level of 1.5 billion sloty, coverage ratio close to 34%, which is in the market. The good news is that we are still keeping on negotiating with our customers, so already close to 800 customers uh, agree about the proposal, and the um, negotiation has been totally um, uh, finalized and completed with 564 customers. In the first half of the year, we have decided uh, to strengthen and to stabilize our deposit base. So um, deposit grew by 13.6%. Um, recently, uh, after the stabilization, we have decided to optimize the structure of the deposit, and which is explaining the new trend quarter to quarter, meaning that individual loan, uh, individual deposit grew by 6.4% compared to the previous quarter, and in the second quarter, a slight decrease in terms of uh, uh, institutional, institutional customer deposit. The mix in terms of deposit is also changing as a consequence of interest rate, so the share of the term of deposit is increasing. As a consequence of the interest rate hike, uh, investment products are significantly impacted. Year to year, investment product decreased by 38.4%, and quarter to quarter, 14.9%. Uh, net interest income. So, net interest income uh, grew significantly year to year, plus 44.3%, the main driver being the growth in our loan book increase in the interest of the interest rate, but we have to, to, to refer also to some additional uh, parameters, such as our aging strategy, which is impacting the evolution quarter to quarter and also year to year. As you can see, we are also gradually adjusting the cost of the deposit. So the cost of the deposit increase in uh, the second quarter compared to the first one and the margin, that is margin, is increasing and we reach a level of 3.29 in the second quarter. Very good resilience in terms of fees and commission, we deliver another very good quarter. Year to year, fees and commission grew by 19.8%, which is a good performance and we perform in, in all the, all the segments, all the activities. Uh, Q2 compared to Q1, Minus 1.9%, which remain a very good, uh, very good level. In terms of net trading income, so year to year minus 18.7%, but we have to take into consideration two components. The first one is coming from the very good performance in terms of transaction with our customers, which goes significantly and reach a level of 186 million sloty in the second quarter. But in parallel, we have another phenomenon, which is coming from the cost of FX swap, which is explaining the decrease in the net trading income, and another negative parameter, which is coming from the negative valuation of equities. In terms of net, net investment income, slight decrease uh, by 23.7%, uh, which is coming from the lack of sales of bonds in 2022 compared to 2021. 
cost. So the cost uh, grew by 31.2%, resulting from the normalization of the business, normalization of the costs such as BFG, IPS creation, and also the level of inflation. Uh, excluding BFG and IPS creation, uh, the costs are growing by 14.6%. Quarter to quarter, the main driver of the growth were the legal cost and also some uh, consulting and IT, and, and IT, um, IT cost. What is really important is that we are keeping on changing our business model, and as you can see, uh, the level of staff is, is decreasing quarter to quarter. And we are keeping on working on this topic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Q2, if we look at the cost of risk, it's 37 basis points, and it's not a very big difference from previous quarters. What's more important here is what we have inside that, because the changes are quite substantial in terms of that 37 million. So we had the release reversal of COVID, which we have some things that didn't materialize. So we made the decision that we should maintain that any longer. So that's really the reversal of 200 million. And then we have 27 million as a result of implementing, of having the LPD lifetime approach and a portion of that was qualified as belonging to phase two. We have a positive impact of 15 million as a result of selling a non-performing portfolio. And then we added 15 million in provisions for Swiss franc loans. We're talking about loans that are undergoing restructuring and recovering. And so, so the performance of credit risk. The overall portfolio is good, but we're talking about the legal risks linked to this portfolio. So generally speaking, we can say this is where we could end, but thinking about what else could happen in the not so distant future and how the economy might function in terms of the growth or the lack of growth, we'd like to anticipate what might happen. So we've selected a group that could have problems, potential problems. And so we've put it into phase two in terms of the level of provisions so it's 2.2 billion and 85 million watts. These are customers who are operating normally, but they're at risk of high energy cost increases. So we're talking about anticipating things and not about the materialization of provisions. What else have we done? We've looked at the potential change and of macroeconomic inflation change of interest rates or severing supply chains and what could happen with PD in terms of various portfolios in the bank. And here we've been anticipating another 128 million of provisions. As a result, we have to think that the 85 and 128 million, this is not something that has materialized. This is more of a, an approach like we had with COVID, but for different reasons. Now, if we look about or think about where we are, what we have in front of us, and looking at the NPL ratio of 3.2%. And so you can see 
the limited amount of new defaults in all segments up until now and good restructuring of the current portfolio which means that at the end of the day we have nominally uh, an NPL portfolio of under 3 billion so so we can say that regardless of the set customer segment everything is operating well and correctly so if we look at the various phases and so this is only phase two this is where we actually did um, basically some changes and this was a deliberate decision and so this is something that we've done so in each one of the segments of the client we've improved and so coverage continues to grow because new defaults are a very finite quality very low the portfolio is getting older and so the older it is the level of coverage grows because we added 150 million provisions and so we're above 60 percent and we believe that this is a very safe level for the Bodo capital ratio during the first part of the year uh, capital ratio decrease i'm going to focus on tier one which is a level of uh, 10.98 percent which is explained on one side by the increase of the business and the growth in LWA and the negative impact coming from the relation of the bond portfolio. All in all, capital ratio are still well above the minimum capital requirement, which is the most important. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming on to the end of the presentation and then we can go on to the Q&A session. I'd like to say, when we talk about the amount that the bank has paid since 2016 for a variety of burdens, I said in millions, it's actually more than 4.7 billion Zwadis. The figure was correctly given on the slide. So what awaits us? Certainly uncertain times. It's uncertainty for a variety of reasons the geopolitical situation the macroeconomic situation inflation and what's going to happen with inflation these credit holidays so but they've only been in place for some two weeks and so how they will roll out and their impact on the banking sector is something we don't know yet we have more uncertainty linked to mortgage loans fx loans and a challenge is the decline in capital as a result of these revaluation or remeasurement of bonds portfolio and um, treasuries and so this is important when we think about the capacity of the sector to finance the economy and then we have the uh, reform of benchmark I hope that we're going to be able to utilize a more reasonable framework I'd like to say two things first our bank is an organization that's gone through a major transformation we've gotten much stronger we've shown our cap capacity to generate a bigger income on our base and we have that capacity to grow had we not gone through all of that in the past then our ability to absorb what we're going to face would be more limited now we're able to absorb what's happening and we believe that even in a very difficult time a well-prepared organization can grow can grow market share and can go through difficult times in a pretty decent shape and can get stronger than its competitors and we believe or i believe that we are such an organization my second reflection is that 
having in mind what's happened recently with these credit holidays above all the banking sector is in such a state that it will not be able to endure any other ideas like this and so i'm imploring those who are responsible for this to be very reticent coming when looking at new ideas that could compromise the strength of the banking sector in terms of how the banking sector treats and serves individual customers and institutions. This is our task, our responsibility, and we want to do this properly. And that would be more or less it, it in terms of the material we wanted to present to you today. So we have other information in the materials. Uh, so I think we should go ahead and move on to the Q&A session. And we can start the Q&A session with a question about whether it's the question from any of the people who are present here in the room today. We have a large number of questions from people who are participating remotely. I'm from Pulse Biznesso. My question is about the dividend as a result of the fact that you've not been able to pay a dividend for so many years. The macroeconomic conditions are worse and worse. For how many more years can we forget about entirely that you're going to actually pay a dividend? Thank you. So we're not forgetting about the ability to pay a dividend. We think we should pay dividends to our shareholders. But it's very difficult to say when that time will appear that the bank will be able to pay a dividend responsibly and of course sharing the right level of profits with its uh, shareholders uh, so for, i'm from others i wanted to ask about the corporate credit loans about the future there what sort of decline do you anticipate you said you expect some declines and what about the quality of the portfolio if I remember well, in Q2, it was a high, slightly increase in NPLs for far farmers. And one more question. Could you give us some numbers about how many applications have you received for these credit holidays? If you have that data, how many have you received so far? And also from this uh, borrower support fund. I'll start with the corporate loans. And from the second part of the question, we believe that the corporate portfolio has very good quality. Our customers should be able to make do navigate the economic slowdown. We do not anticipate a material increase in the cost of risk linked to this portfolio. In terms of the decline, I think as follows. The upcoming quarters will be a special challenge for retail customers, especially for mortgage loans. I don't anticipate that this market will be big. I believe that if we look at corporate customers, a lot of things will be happening. So I think that in upcoming quarters, the corporate business will be the business that will continue to be able to grow. This doesn't apply to all companies, but to the stronger companies, they might be able to take advantage of the situation in order to grow their market share and to do M&A activity. And we're totally ready to do that. If we look at the credit holidays, there's a lot of questions about credit holidays, also from the online. So I'll try to respond to that once. First, let me remind you that we haven't been dealing with this for a full two weeks in terms of the time that these credit holidays are available. And so the number of applications is in line with our expectations. I'd like to emphasize that we're uh, actually processing them very smoothly we haven't had any stormy times and so it's all being done online customers are communicating with us by online and we're actually 
handling and processing those applications smoothly. How it, what the final outcome will be, nobody knows. As you know, the largest number of, of these credit holidays applications. So the first day when it started was the 29th of July. That's when we've seen the biggest number of applications. Since then, we've seen a decline in the number of applications. But I think we need more, a longer observation period in order to be able to say how many applications will be filed or submitted and what will be the total cost of these credit holidays. If we think about the number of applications for the borrower support fund, this is a relatively small number compared to credit holidays. Of course, it's substantially bigger than it was in the corresponding period of last year. I'm not sure if we should quantify that. So, 221 uh, applications this year. Thank you. I remembered 200. I didn't remember the end. So, that's the magnitude of this phenomenon. And so, we have money in the f uh, borrower support fund. We'll have to add money. I think I responded to all of your questions. So, thank you. I'm from Business Insider. Much I've got. I wanted to ask. I have three questions. Can I ask all of them? Let's go ahead and try that. My first one is about the interest margin. Is this the peak in terms of what's happened with deposits and interest rates? The second question is about the coverage ratio. That's 33% right now. I wanted to say, how much will it grow? It seemed at one point in time that that would be the optimum level. And the third question is about the capital situation in terms of tier one it's falling your tier one and the question is is there a risk that you're going to have to raise equity in terms of increasing the free float that the bank has to expand by the end of 2023 maybe i'll begin in terms of the final question and then i'll ask jean charles to add some words in terms of what's important. We don't see any risk which would cost us to breach the equity ratios, which would lead to a necessity to raise equity. We're going to continue doing activities which will optimize the utilization of the equity, the capital, and our forecasts show that we should be on the safe side. So we do not plan to raise equity in the foreseeable f future. The first question was about the interest margin. The second question about the coverage of the Swiss franc risk. I don't think there's a person who could tell you what level of coverage is the right level, finally. If we look at the level of coverage, amongst the Swiss franc banks where we have a higher level of coverage, but at the same time, participants in this game are continuing to bump up that coverage ratio. And this is something that we'll probably continue to do, but maybe not the same level that we saw last year. Much depends on what happens, the development of these pilot settlement agreements. We're doing better and better here. We're doing it more and more efficiently. And this is starting to have material uh, impact in terms of reducing the Swiss franc risk. Now, the, is the margin at the highest level, do you think? factor to take into consideration what will be done in terms of future interest rate and also the pressure we have on the deposit. So we saw on the market that there is uh, a pressure in terms of cost of deposit. Uh, so today, it's too early to say this is, a, this is a peak or not. We have a few phenomena to monitor. So generally speaking, we can say we'll see. There's pressure on deposits. We don't know what's going to happen with the um, interest rates. So we'll see. I'm from Santander. I can hear you. My observation. So, 
generally my question is as follows. What sort of competitive edge does your bank have over other banks that's enabling you to grow more quickly? And then I have a more detailed question about the corporate segment and whether stopping to sell mortgage banks to external customers, is that something that's significant? Is that going to have a major impact on your sales? And I might have another question, but so the competitive advantages we have, well, this is a longer topic. So we have a growth strategy and we've clearly said that we want to grow and we want to grow in all market segments. That's how we're managing our resources, our people, to ensure that this is possible. We're investing more in technology. The quality of our solutions is improving regularly, and this makes things easier. And this is a necessary precondition in order to achieve growth. And so we have better processes. We're able to do things more quickly, more efficiently, more effectively. There's still a lot for us to do, no doubt about that. And in our institutional business, we're not afraid of large amounts, especially if we're thinking about syndicant um, transactions and we're able to do big transactions, complex transactions very quickly. And this is a result of the quality of the people we have on board, as well as working together with the BMPP uh, uh, group Paribas Group, and this is the very the strong corporate banking group. If you look at our structure, you can see that this component of the business, the institutional business, is bigger than other banks from the peer group. So we're a very strong corporate bank. We're stronger. I don't want to mention the names of the competitors, but we're a stronger bank in this area. And so I think that the quality of our people, the spirit of growth, the investments we've made in technology, these are the things that drive us, drive our, our, the attractiveness of, that we have, and that's why we're growing faster. You were asking in particular about corporate. I don't really understand the aspect you want to ask about. I understand the first thing. But now the question about mortgages. Is this an important thing in terms of your sales? Let me tell you. The mortgage loan market has basically fallen off dramatically. If you look at the BEAK data, this was a decline of 55% year on year, and it's actually getting bigger and bigger, that dip, that decline. And there are a number of factors that are driving that. First is interest rates and the cost of mortgage loans to be borne by borrowers. And many borrowers have decided not to take um, the loan because they believe that it's going to be very difficult for them to finance that with their household budget. The next thing is credit worthiness. As we know, the credit worthiness is calculated using the current market interest rates plus a buffer. It's more difficult, and this is clear, for customers to have credit worthiness with this level of interest rates. We still have high level of prices for apartments and and people who want to build themselves should have high cost to build. So all of those factors taken together mean that the mortgage loan market is at a dramatically low level. So all of those things, the fact that we've limited our willingness to give loans to our existing customer base and then thinking about green mortgages, well, this doesn't have material importance right now. I'm a pessimist. If we look at mortgage loans over the upcoming quarters, also for next year, much will depend on what's going to happen in terms of the benchmark reform. There was an idea presented there where if benchmark reform would be pushed back in time, but then as of 1 January, banks should issue loans uh, according to a new benchmark where that benchmark hasn't been selected. This is something that could dissuade banks from uh, giving loans on a floating rate. Well, to think about this from a different approach, well, the mortgage loan has turned out to be a product where we've had 
the biggest non-credit risk materializing. So the regulatory risk. So if we look at Swiss francs or now Polish Wadi franc loans or credit holidays, well, there's a bit of a shadow cast onto this product's image. And so we can say we have highly sophisticated consumer interest protection. So we could say that this protection is excessive in some cases. That's why I don't foretell or see a beautiful rosy picture future for mortgage loans. I wanted to talk about the fragile loans in the retail section. What type of clients were in this portfolio? I'll respond to the question. There are two segments. We were checking the credit worthiness of customers who were close to the boarding borderline, according to our score systems. We also looked at people who had mortgage loans. With mortgage loans, the issue is as follows. Today, we have these credit holidays. And what we're discussing is credit holidays for all customers. So right now, in this pool of customers, we have customers who, from the point of view of credit worthiness, their ability to service their debts, they don't need credit holidays. They have the ability to finance it. So in my opinion, they're just making taking financial benefit from this situation. And then they'll come back to the normal schedule of repayment, amortization schedule. But there's certainly a pool of customers that need this help. But since the credit holidays are available, there'll be a shift. So today they won't be in stage two or stage three because the credit holidays are available. But when this comes to an end, this will be the end of next year. And so if interest rates don't fall by that time, well, then there's a certain probability that those customers could potentially face problems with paying down or servicing their liabilities, and then they would move into stage two or stage three if their income doesn't grow in the meantime. Okay, thank you. So let's go on to questions from the online environment. So structurally, I'm going to overlook questions about the number of applications for credit holidays. With a few exceptions, we'll try to respond to the other questions. So we have a question here from Thomson Reuters. I already responded to that question. Then we have Pico Bibi. What is the demand for mortgage loans with fixed interest rate for a 10-year period? In Q2, generally speaking, in Q2, we can say that fixed loans were fixed interest rate loans. So it was interesting that when interest rates were low, uh, there wasn't very, there was only marginal interest. Now that rates are up, now there's more interest in fixed interest rates. So, so it, the fixed interest rate for, so it's 56%, you know, for a five year period. And so, and then the rest was in uh, floating rates. So thank you very much. What's the impact on mortgage loan sales in Q2? What was the impact of the bank's decision just to give it to uh, existing customers? Well, there was almost no impact because we announced this decision in Q2, but we were processing applications submitted earlier. So it was a marginal impact or no impact. Then we have, I just supposed to the parquet with a question here. 
I'd like to ask what is the impact of the credit holidays on uh, the mortgage sales? I think we already mentioned that. We also talked about the supply of these loans. So you had said that you've been selling more payment cards. Why do you see the impact? Does that mean that polls are starting to lack uh, liquidity? I don't think that's the reason. I think it's this instrument is very convenient, especially during holidays and and sometimes it's necessary because if you want to rent a car or you want to rent a hotel room so there's more interest in payment cards our payment cards have a nice functionality so we are betting on this product and so it ties it ties uh, customers to the bank and we would like for our customers to have attractive products and that's why we believe in these products this payment cards you talked about m a transactions financed by the bank what sectors do you see as this consolidation consolidation in the bigger transactions in the second half of the year where do you see them taking place so i don't think it's a sector-based thing of course it could be a matter of generational um, issues where the founders of businesses of companies and businesses people who are setting up their companies at the beginning of the transformation in poland are now reaching an age where they don't feel that they should continue to manage these businesses actively and now they're thinking about passing the torch on to somebody else through an M&A transaction or perhaps they would be willing to take a company to go to the market well this is not so much specific to a given industry in terms of what's going to happen in the second half of the year we'll have to wait for the second half of the year to find out what happens and I think that's it we also have a question from Tom Sanders do you plan to take actions to reduce the costs of credit holidays. I'd like to take that off offline. I'd like to understand what sort of activities could be taken because the law and you have the Office of Consumer Protection doesn't leave us much room. So we had to implement this in a fair way. So it happily uh, learn about the methods you could use to reduce these costs. So basically once interest rates fall and then we'll have a positive impact uh, from these credit holidays, but we'll have to wait and see. Here's another question about credit holidays. In terms of the low probability of paying dividends, is this because of the VBOR reform? Well, we've been saying, well, the credit vacations or holidays have an impact because they're they, they're charged to the result, the net banking income, and do not enable us to raise the level of equity. I don't think the VBOR reform has any impact on our, our, us not being able to pay a dividend. Now, EPPM, what is the impact of new regulations in terms of not charging additional fees until a mortgage is placed in the more land and mortgage re register well this is not a material impact so if we talk about the future with such a low level of production of mortgage loans we can say this is something that will be totally marginal then we talked about the borrower support fund having in mind the solutions in q2 linked to the pandemic does the bank have additional ability to set up provisions linked to COVID that you could release in reverse in upcoming quarters. Well, some perhaps, perhaps you, Wojtek, in terms of the COVID provision, well, it's been reversed to zero, the pure COVID provision. This is what I said previously. If we look at a forward-looking uh, approach, there are certain provisions set up for fragile customers plus for customers where the inflation could have a major impact through the interest rates and severing supply chains these are things 
which are in the bank's balance sheet in terms of, of provisions. We have another question. We have the number of litigation is growing in Q2. What could be the impact of provisions? Well, this is what we've just said. We're monitoring this situation on an ongoing basis. And so we add new provisions. We added 140 million in provisions in Q2. Depending on the situation, we'll react. And so we'll react according to the way how the situation develops. I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we have this pilot project of entering into settlement agreements and we're doing better and better here. Then we have the peak on the interest margin. Then we have a question to Jean Scholl about from Ipo Pema. Needs in 2022 and 23. We have some, we have some estimation, but we have also in parallel some discussion about Emerald de Vol. So I would prefer not to give an estimation in such context. And that was the last question online. And so this is the last time for you to pose a question from here in the room. I see there is a question from here in the room. I have a question about the impact of these credit holidays. So if you could tell us what are going to be the long-term consequences in terms of margins because loan margins because the bank's going to have to incorporate that in the margins. What's going to be the carry-on impact in terms of being surprised by what's happening in the regulatory sphere? Well, that's a very broad question about this sector's policy. I think the sector would like to sit down at the table with the public party broadly represented and talk about that in a human fashion. I think we should say the sector should be able to talk to the actual circumstances the way it is. We should also try to convince the public party that we're not going to be able to withstand or endure any more burdens. Number three, that we want to be a partner in terms of various things. We helped in you know during the pandemic when we were distributing funds from PFR and nobody asked for any money for that. We did that quickly and efficiently. Just now with IPS or the commercial bank protection system. We want to be a partner. We want to work together. We want to do initiatives together. We'd like to sit at a round table. We'd like to ask for a change in the narration. As I talked, as I said previously, I think that's about it. So thank you very much. I have a sign that we should wrap things up now. So I'd like to thank you very much for attending here physically. And I'd like to thank those of you who participated digitally. And so until next time, thank you.